Okay. How's everybody doing? <laughs> you see. Uh, you'll have to pardon me today. I have not eaten yet, and I'm literally going to fall over. I'm breaking out in a cold sweat from lack of food. Okay. First thing I'd like to ask is, are there any questions? So on my course assignment, uh, maybe when we choose the chapters for the previous general article, so the, you asked us to find, like, to determine where the edges of the, way, of the line is. But, like, so what I did is I just summed up over the whole thing. Like Correct. If the noise is random enough, it would just cancel out and it wouldn't be an issue. So do you want us to fit a function to the no. line? No. No. I mean, technically, as a professional spectroscopist, there is a way to determine the extreme edges of the, where the line, let me put it the other way around, where the data become consistent with being continuum, mm -hmm. okay? There is a there is a, a statistical objective numerical way to do that, and you get, you know, the region where, okay, the line starts here, the line ends there uh, in wavelength. Mm -hmm. And then you just sum the information over that region of the, of the line. So there's a statistical way to do it. Yes, there is. is. There is. And I'm happy to sit down and show anybody who wants to know how to do that. It's actually very elegant, very beautiful, very clean, and not, you know, a couple lines of code. Um, uses the noise characteristics of the data to do it. So it's it's self-consistent with the data. Okay. Um, as soon as the line gets like such and such above the void, it's like the line. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Sorry? You just look at the standard deviation or that God, I thought I had hearing aids on. Can you I say it? Saying, you can look, you can just look at the standard deviation, right? Right. You could also look at the standard deviation and basically eyeball it for yourself, which is all I had anticipated you would do. Um, I can't remember if I actually said don't do the whole spectrum or I can't remember if I actually said that. He said just do what you want. <laughs> okay. Because I, I think I wanted to see what you would do. And the reason is that um, a couple people did the whole spectrum, and the the thought that the fluctuation of the continuum should zero out in the equivalent width itself is a very correct thought, that it should do that, okay? Unfortunately, the, sum, the, the error in that measurement, if you sum over the entire spectrum, you're, you're adding noise from pixels that aren't contributing to the equivalent width. So at some level, you have to say, I only want to include the uncertainty measurements that uh, contribute to the actual measurement itself. But theoretically, if it was like an infinite continuum on either side of the line, it would be right? Yeah, even if you had a theoretical infinite wavelength oh. regime that you're looking at, the equivalent width, it would theoretically cancel out. And the equivalent width measurement would be accurate within some, you know, little epsilon. But if you had an infinite wavelength spectrum and you summed up all of the uncertainty pixels, you would get an infinite uncertainty. Okay. That's not good. Yeah. So maybe that helps. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I really apologize. I'm just get a character selling me out of the dead. Um okay. So I had a nice email from one of the students asking me, hey, these are my ideas about the problem, about the Balmer break. You know, am I, uh, am I barking up the right tree? It was great. I wrote back, said some things. So I encourage that if you have some questions. And if I don't happen to be in the office, write it down. They said something like, I believe it's probably the ratio of this to that. And I said, well, if you're barking up the right tree. It's not the ratio, it's the sum. Not that you have to do anything quantitative in that particular problem, but that was sort of the, the conversation as it proceeded. So I love to talk about this stuff. Okay. You know, your biggest fear should be that if you come into my office that I won't shut up and you can't get out and escape. All right. Can we close the door? Thanks for reminding me. I always forget. Okay. You. So I am done. I don't know how.
How does this look? Are we able to see the oh, notes? I can't see it. Yeah, the notes are coming through quite through. well. Okay, good. Okay, after five minutes into class, I'm wondering if you're ready for me to commence. Okay. Um, then I'm going to ask you at the end of the class, does working from these notes work better for you than the handwritten notes? I want to know what you think, because it's important to me to, you know, do this in a way that works the best. All right. Anybody know where that, there it is. Great. Okay, so last time we uh, met our superheroes, we were talking about Bohr and his model of the atom, and then we talked about the different energy types there are, excitation energy, ionization energy, transition energy, yak, yak, yak. We talked about the uh, fact that excitation energy in the ground state was zero, and um, et cetera. Okay, then we moved over to the wave model and we talked about de Broglie's little hypothesis for his PhD. And Schrodinger wrote down a wave equation and came up with uh, a um, description of the electron as a wave, or I should say the entire system of the atom as a wave, okay? And that the wave equation had a spatial and a time component, spatial, and there are separated variables. And that this is basically an oscillatory function uh, that depends upon the energy state, and um, it oscillates with an omega equal to the energy state divided by h bar. Okay, and so that when you operated on this equation with the Hamiltonian, which was the kinetic energy um, and the potential energy or the, the electric uh, potential, you when you when you multiplied this through or carried out this operation on the wave function, it res it gave you the wave function back times the energy of that state. I know you've all seen that before. Okay. So today we're going to talk about this wave function a little bit more. The other thing I wanted to say was that wave functions have an orthogonality to them. This is the Brockett notation of Dirac. It basically says if you take the integral over all space of the complex conjugate of the wave function times the wave function, you get the Dirac delta function, which is to say if n prime equals n, and those are the same states, you get unity. Or they are normalized to each other. But if you do n prime state versus n, you get zero, which is to say the wave functions are orthogonal to each other. We talked about the Born approximation, and we said that if you take the wave function multiplied by its complex conjugate over some in some unit in some small volume element. That, that was the probability of seeing uh, finding the electron in that volume element. Okay? All right. So what we're going to do now is talk about the wave function in terms of a radial component and a spherical harmonic component. We brought up the, uh, you know, I'm not doing the derivation for you, so I'm just, you know, reviewing. We brought up the quantum numbers L, N, L, and M. N was the principal quantum number. It was the radial quantum number, which um, is the quantum number for the radial function, but which is expressed in the principal quantum number, and the angular momentum quantum number. Okay, we realized that L then, because of this behavior, ranged from zero to n minus one. So if you are in state three, it goes zero, one, two. Right, and then we realized that uh, I didn't show it, but m goes from minus L in units of 1 to L. Okay. And then I showed this nice little table up here, which um, illustrates that. For example, if n equals 3, that means that L can go 1, 0, 1, 2. When L is 0, m can only be 0. When L is 1, it can go from minus 1 to plus 1, plus in increments of 1, and when it's 2, it can go from minus 2 to plus 2 in increments of 1. Okay. These turn out to be the number of nodes, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So you have the principal quantum number, 
goes from 1 to infinity, your angular momentum goes from 0 to n minus 1, and your magnetic or um, azimuthal, sorry, yes, azimuthal quantum number um, goes from minus L to L. Now, why am I going through this? Because when we get to multi electron atoms, understanding the hydrogen atom wave mechanics is key for understanding the fine structure of atoms and key for understanding the um, multi-electron atoms, which, let's face it, most spectral lines come from complex multi-electron atoms. And I think, I think it would be doing you injustice if you graduated through grad school and didn't see something about how a multi-electron atom really works. I wish I understood how it works. I have a basic idea. The more electrons you put in, the less I understand about it. Okay. The radial component. Okay, I'm just going to, you know, write it out. Here it is. It depends upon the charge. Remember, we're only talking about hydrogenic atoms, those which have a single electron around them. Once you add more electrons, this, these particular forms do not apply anymore. Okay? Um, so anyway, rho is a normalized variable. It's z over the uh, reduced Bohr radius. The reduced Bohr radius is the Bohr radius times the mass of the electron or the reduced mass of the electron, a number that is very close, a little bit larger than 1 actually, because uh, the reduced mass is usually about 0.99994 or so. So this number is a little more than 1. So the reduced Bohr radius is a little bigger than the Bohr radius. And in fact, what you see is uh, that this variable then scales with the charge and the, the Bohr radius and the state in you're in. Anyway, this is a Laguerre polynomial, which comes through here. You have a, an exponential uh, decay of the amplitude with distance. This is oscillatory, and then this is the normalization. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that you'll find is if you take this radial component and you square it absolute magnitude, multiply it by r squared, that that is something called the radial distribution function. And I'll show you why that's important. Because remember that the wave function squared gives you the probability of locating the electron. So here are some plots. I actually made these myself by coding up the wave functions. Uh, N equals 1, L equals 0. And it's basically a single peaked node. Okay. The, um, the dash curve is the electron charge times the square of the radial function. That's the dash curve. So that's, in a sense, that's the charge density. And then the probability of finding the electron at that radius is given by the solids. Uh, that's the um, radial distribution function. And you can see that the probability, the most probable distance out for the electron in units of the Bohr radius is, lo and behold, one Bohr radius. Okay, that makes sense. And these are normalized probabilities such that the peak is one. Okay, everybody with me on that? Very simple, it says there is a radial distribution over which you should find that electron, and um, the probability is highest at the Bohr radius, which is where, you know, good old Bohr said it would be. Okay, go to n equals two. L equals zero, which is to say no nodes in the polar direction, you get two peaks, with the highest probability being out here at around, I don't know what it is, about five point something Bohr radii. And you have a, a, another small peak of probability that actually it, you can find this one actually at the Bohr radius. Okay, But if you say you're at N equals two, but you have a single node, so this is the p orbitals, you actually have only one peak in your probability distribution function at that same Bohr radius. It's actually a little bit lower, about four. Okay, So the p orbitals actually, the probability density peaks a little bit inside the n equals two spherical L equals zero density. And then, you know, three, zero, three, one, three, two, and then again, it's notice with three, most probability that the electrons out here at around 12 Bohr radii, with some 
reduced probability that you'll find it in the range around about four four radii and some probability that you'll find it within the four radius. Again, the charge density is given by the dash line. Okay. Any questions about that? So that's what it looks like if 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 this is what it looks like for us this is a spherically distributed probability density around the nucleus these are not and I'll show that in just a minute okay this is just the peak but with theta and phi these functions change their amplitudes this equation it behaves the same way that if you take the volume air the, the surface volume let's say the volume element uh, and you take RNL and RNL squared and integrate over radius it's it's unity okay now let's talk about the azimuthal and polar components okay this is defined by the spherical harmonic theta phi okay theta is going to come from the z-axis zero degrees go to pi at the negative z-axis it is the polar angle and phi is the azimuthal angle it starts at the x equals zero axis and goes two pi around in the xy plane okay so it's two functions a theta and a phi function okay the azimuthal component azimuthal being in the xy plane is simply a e x to the i m phi which is basically to say that it, whoops, I forgot the m in this equation, um, that it goes as, a, as oscillatory in the phi direction. And the theta is much more complicated, but you can see that it's, again, it's equal to, proportional to Legendre polynomials and has an amplitude that depends upon L and M, okay? and has a behavior that if m is greater than zero it behaves this way and if m is less than zero it's anti-symmetric okay uh, and then so that means that the full spherical harmonics are given by these equations here for positive m and negative m and so you see that they're orthonormal as well but if you take the complex conjugate of uh, the spherical harmonic uh, times the spherical harmonic uh, real the, the real part then you get the Dirac delta functions here when L prime equals L and M prime equals M in other words the same state this is one and if they differ then it's zero this is what they look like you've probably seen these before here's your coordinate system polar angle theta coming down from the z-axis and phi going around in the xy plane so here's L equals zero boom and this is m equals 0 l equals 0 and this is l equals 1 m equals 0 so basically as you come down you see there's one anti node in the probability distribution function probability is highest gets lower oh sorry yes yeah, getting lower it's getting lower it's getting lower and the probability goes to 0 in the plane so for m equals 0, l equals 1, the probability that the electron is in the xy plane is absolutely and totally 0. Okay. And then vice versa, for m equals minus 1, uh, it's prob zero probability is in the z plane, but it could be somewhere along here in the along the x or the y, sorry, and then m equals 1 probability along the x. And then you get more complicated at l equals 2 because now you have two nodes one two in the polar direction see that so you go anti-node sorry it's anti-nodes anti-node okay see already what i mean by that it's hard to explain and then you have basically these uh the number of nodes two nodes here in phi and one node here in phi etc zero nodes here in phi are anti-nodes so you see how it is it's really interesting it's a wave it's a standing wave and just like if I oscillate a rope against the wall I can do it such that it has one anti node two anti nodes three anti nodes okay? it's just a standing wave that is set by and how how big these waves are depends upon how
how far I am away from the wall, right? So it's, a, it's just because space is finite, it is, um, and the waves are steady state, if you will, that you get these number of nodes that are allowed. You get these spherical harmonics. It's a, it's a consequence of the fact of a boundary condition in this direction and a boundary condition in this direction. But there's no boundary condition with R. Okay, Just like there's a boundary condition between me and the rope okay, that causes that rope to have a standing wave, there's a boundary condition in theta and there's a boundary condition in B. And that causes you to, allows you to have different wavelengths based upon the number of nodes or antinodes that you have. And that's how that's how the electron behaves because it's a wave around the nucleus. That's essence of wave mechanics. Any questions? So here are some probability distributions, which is to say we've taken the square of the wave function, okay? 2, 0, 0, 2, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 3, 0, 0. You can see here, remember when I showed you the radial function, it had three peaks, the biggest peak, the second biggest peak, the smaller peak. You see that? The three peaks there. When you get to four, it has four peaks. It's the number of peaks in the probability that n equals. Um, so, then you have these different shapes for, um, for these wave functions. So this is the um, probability distribution of where you would, should find the electron if you were to randomly sample it sometime, you know, if the electron really was a particle. And you did experiment such that the, it manifests itself as a particle. This would be where you find it. Are we ready to move on to what L is interpreted as? Okay, I all I said that spatially L is interpreted as the number of antinodes in the polar direction. Okay, but in fact, it also can be interpreted as a vector, which is processing around the z-axis. Because in a sense, those standing waves, let's say you've got your p orbitals or whatever. Well, those, those standing waves have a, a momentum associated with them. Okay. So here's little l, the quantum number. The magnitude of the angular momentum is the square root of little l times l plus 1 times h bar that whole quantity times h bar, okay, the magnitude of L. The magnitude of the projection of the angular momentum on the z-axis is the magnetic quantum number times h bar. So here's an example, okay, of, this is the square root of 2. So I think this is L equals 1. Let me see, make sure I've got it right. Yes, L equals 1, case A, L equals 1, for which the magnitude of L is the square root of 2. Okay, so L equals 1, 1 times 2, square root of 2, h bar, all right? So here's the z-axis, here is the length, it's the square root of 2 of the angular momentum, and because L equals 1, M could be minus 1, 0, or plus 1, so that angular momentum vector could process with the projection of one h-bar along the z-axis and process like that. It could process with, an, with uh, a projection of zero h-bar, n equals zero, and around the z-axis this way, or with a projection of minus one and process this way. Okay. So if L equals two, then 2 times 3 is 6, square root of 6, so that's a much longer vector, okay, a longer vector, and then it can have projections if L equals 2 of 2, 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2. Okay. Now, the electron in a hydrogenic atom doesn't exist in all of those states at once. It has the opportunity to exist in all of those states. 
but if it's a single electron, it really only exists in one of those states. So if you say the electron is in the um, n equals 2 Balmer state and has L equals 2 and m minus 1, that is a specific state for the electron given by that. Okay. And then, uh, well, this is just an example showing the precession for uh, for the case of little l equals 1, okay? Where this is a length of square root of 2, and this is a projection of 1. Okay. Now, this is all going to become important later when we talk about transitions because we're going to find out that not every transition can happen. There are only allowed transitions and forbidden transitions. Okay? I'll get into that. Now, there is a thing called the multiplicity of states. And for the Schrodinger album, atom, it's wrong by a factor of two. If you are, say, in the n equals two stage, well, let's put you in the n equals three stage. If you are in the n, we'll go back to this diagram, one, two, three. If you're in the n equals three stage, okay, how many possible states are available to the electron? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three squared. You see that? It could be in the zero, zero state, or the one minus one state, or the two minus plus two state, or the two minus one state. There's nine possible ways it can occupy the n equals 3 principle level. All right. What about the n equals 2 principle level? 1, 2, 3, 4. 2 squared. Okay. So basically, according to Bohr, the multiplicity of states for a given principle quantum level okay, is n squared. We label that G sub N L, meaning 2L plus 1. Let's go back to this. How many possible... If, if you want to know, if I'm in the uh, N equals 2, L equals 1 state, what is my multiplicity? It's 3. So it's 2 times this plus 1. If I'm over here, I'm in the 3, and, and I know that I'm at uh, an n equals 2 and n equals 3, n equals, okay, n, n L state of 3, 2, then how many possible states could I be in? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It turns out that that's 2 times this number plus 1. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. So the multiplicity, if you know the n L state, is 2L plus 1, okay, 2L plus 1, 2L plus 1, 2L plus 1. All is zero equals one. Okay. But if you then have to sum that over the L states to get the total multiplicity, so that's what this equation is showing you. G sub N L is the 2L plus 1. So if you know your N state and your L state, the number of N states you can occupy is 2L plus 1. You sum that over all N states, or sorry, all L states which can go from 0 to n minus 1, and you get n squared. So if you know what you're in principle level n, it's n squared. Okay. That's what Schrodinger came up with. And he and that's wrong, actually, because of spin. So he didn't know about spin. So I am reminding you, Schrodinger's model does not include electron spin. He didn't know about it. Now, I'm introducing this to you because in, when we talk about multi-electron atoms, this, if you want, I can't just start talking about them and start talking about multiplicity of states. It just, you got to see it with the simple single electron atom first. Again, the electron will only occupy one of those states, but those are the number of possible states it can occupy. Okay, multiplicity of states. All right. Now, something you may or may not have seen in your quantum mechanics book is how do you actually calculate the energy of a given state? Of a given state. The way you do it is you take this 
spatial integral, and you sandwich in between it the operator. And that gives you the expectation value for that operator. In other words, if you want to have some property y, then there'll be some equation that you can operate on the wave function. Let me just take this derivative, multiply it by this, divide it by that, and it will return that quantum number. So, or that value. Now, you take the complex conjugate times the, the wave function itself. You operate on this one. You multiply it by that one. You integrate over all space. That's what this means. You get out the expectation y for the property that gets revealed by doing that mathematical operation on the wave function. Now, the one that gives you the energy, well, we talked about that before. If you operate on the wave function at, for principal state n, it gives you the energy of principal state n times the wave function back. Okay. So the one that gives you the energy is the Hamiltonian. So you do this where this y and you use the Hamiltonian. Okay. Which means you're taking that spatial derivative to give you back the kinetic energy and you're multiplying it by the potential energy. And then you do the integral and you get back the energy. So when you do this with the Schrodinger model, guess what you get? you get the exact same solution that Bohr got. So now you've got the same exact energy structure with the Schrodinger atom that Bohr gave you. Okay? That's beautiful science. Stepping into a new territory using wave mechanics, getting the same solution as the semi-classical model. That's how science is done, step by step. Great. But what's different between Bohr and Schrodinger? Bohr had circular orbits. There was only one state that the electron could exist in, in every in principal end state. There was only one place for that electron to go. Okay. And Schrodinger said, no, if it's at level n, it has n squared possible ways of occupying that level because we have these angular momentums. Okay? That is a huge difference in understanding atoms. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about transitions, and I'm going to introduce selection rules. I'm not going to tell you where they come from. That comes later. All right. Most people don't know where they come from. I'd like you to walk away having some notion of where these come from. Okay, you've heard of allowed transitions and forbidden transitions. I'm now going to give you the details of how those behave in the Schrodinger model, which is incomplete. Now, remember we said that the energy uh, uh, of a transition from state n to n prime or n prime to n was e sub n minus e sub n prime. Okay, so that's how we get the energies of the transitions. It's exactly the same energy structure and principles as we do for Bohr. But there are selection rules. Okay. Oh, notice, very important, I forgot to mention. Notice that this energy only depends upon one of the principal quantum numbers, just like it did with Bohr. So even though, I forgot to mention this, even and you already know it, even though uh, the energy only depends upon the principal quantum number for that state, the electron could exist in n squared different possible angular momentum states. But they all have the same energy because the energy does not include any information about the L or M state. Therefore, these are energy degenerate states, and you've heard that before. So I know I'm doing a lot of review here, but this review is really going to be key for understanding the multi-electron atoms. When's the last time most of you saw this? 
Uh, last spring? <laughs> Years. Okay. Well, hopefully it's coming back. You know, if I'm boring you a little bit, that's good. That means, oh yeah, yeah, my cobwebs have cleared away and uh, yeah, I got it. Okay. Here are the selection rules. Okay. For a transition to happen, first of all, there are no selection rules. Uh, well, we'll get into that later. It doesn't make any sense with direct to talk about it. Clearly, a transition, if the energy is going to be changed in the atom and a photon is to be released or absorbed, you have to go from some state N prime to some state N. N has to change. And N can change by any amount, by 10, by 1, by 5. There's no selection rule on that. But given that change in M, the electron must change its M state, and it must change its L state. You cannot go from N equals 3, L equals 0, M equals 0, to 2, N equals 2, L equals 0, M equals 0. You can't do it. It's not allowed by the physics. And I'm not going to tell you about why yet or where that comes from, but I will. And I guarantee you that should be new stuff for you. Okay, so basically, you have the rule that L prime has to equal plus or minus 1 of L. So L prime can equal L plus 1, or L prime can equal L minus 1. And M prime is equal also to plus or minus 1, no matter whether L is equal to those. So independently, L has to be plus or minus 1. But it turns out that M can, all, can be, uh, be zero. So I, I misspoke briefly there. But L has to change by one, up or down, and only up one or down. You can't go from N equals four, L equals three, down to N equals two, L equals zero. You can't, you can't do that. You can only change by one. Okay. M can either stay the same or change by one. That's it. Okay. All right. So let's see what the energy diagram now looks like. First of all, I want to introduce to you some spectroscopic notation. And again, these are handwritten in the notes, maybe in a more clear way, and in a paragraph. So I'm going to write them on the board here for you. Okay. For L, we have spectroscopic notation. Now, the spectroscopic notation comes around historically, S meaning sharp, D meaning diffuse, F meaning even more diffuse, okay? Now, why would some lines be sharp and some lines be diffuse? Well, we're going to find out. It's because of fine structure, because we're going to find out a lot of these lines are actually multiple little lines right next to each other. And in the old days, the spectrographs couldn't resolve those well. So the lines just looked a little bit more blurry and diffuse. Okay. L equals 0, 1, 2, 3. This is called sharp, diffuse. I forget what that is. More diffuse. Oops. Principal, diffuse, and more diffuse. Sorry. So I okay, got that right. L equals 0 is S, so if your N equals 1, L equals 0, you denote yourself 1S. Here it is, L equals 0. Uh, S is for L equals 0, P for L equals 1, D for L equals 2, and F for L equals 3. Sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental, that's the word I was looking for. Okay. All right, so if you're given subshell in L, like say N equals 1, L equals 0, that's 1S. Okay. Now, Given that, these are what the transitions can look like. Now, this does not include the M states. This only includes L and M. Okay. Maybe I should speak more clearly. This does not include the M states. It only includes N and L. Okay. Along here is L. L equals 0, 1, 2, SDP. Here's the energy, zero. This is the um, excitation energy. 
from 0 to 10.2 to 12.088 for n equals 1, 2, and 3. Here's the binding energy, minus 13.5 mA for 1, minus 3.4 for 2, minus 1.51 for 3, et cetera, et cetera. If you are transitioned now, you can only transition along these particular paths. Notice you cannot transition from n equals 2, L equals 0, to n equals 1, L equals 0, or et cetera, et cetera. In fact, you cannot transition from n equals 3D to n equals 1S. You can't do it. And you, and you might be going, why? I want to know why. I'll show you why in a bit. Okay. Any questions? So we call these transitions normally the 2P-1S transition, whether it's upwards or downwards. So you might see that a lot in notation, 2P-1S, you know, 3D-2S, oops, can't do that one. So you, you should be able to, I should be able to write them down and you should say, no, you can't do that one. Okay. You can't do from here to here. So now I want to talk about transitions in this way. We have a name for that transition. We've been talking about it a lot. What do we call it? Line and alpha. In Bohr's model, that's that transition. There's H alpha from 3 to 2. Let's look what that looks like in Lyman alpha. H alpha is 3 to 2, right? Oh, check this out. There are one, two, three ways to create an H alpha photon or to absorb an H alpha photon in the Schrodinger model. When the photon comes in, you could in absorb in the say the electron starts here, it could either go to here or it could go to there. Or if the electron started there, it can only go to there. Now you might be thinking to yourself, since if the electron's here and there's two ways for it to go up, maybe the probability of that transition is a little higher. It's, a little, you know, it's got more places to go, so maybe the transition probability is a little higher for absorption if the electron started here than if it started here because it only has one place to go. And you would be right. It's called branching ratios. Okay, And so that availability of states as to where it can transition to or from changes the value of that probability for transit. In other words, it changes the cross section. Remember that? Bigger cross section. This transition has a bigger cross section than this transition because there's more states for it to go to. It's easier for that electron to find a place to go when the photon comes through. I'm going to draw a Lyman beta line now. What transition is that? Lyman beta. 1s. Say it again. 3p1s. 3p1s. Exactly. That's the Lyman beta transition. Okay. Notice that in this case, delta n was 2, delta l was minus 1. If it goes down, or delta l was plus 1 if it goes up. If I had another row of n equals 4 up here, it would have S, D, S, P, D, and F, and I could actually make my Lyman gamma from n equals 3P down to 1S. I say 3P, I mean 4P down to 1S. Get used to this diagram. It's giving you the first hints of what multi electron atoms can do, but it's also wrong because it doesn't include spin. Also, these are equal energy states 
of different m states. Since m has to be 0, plus or minus 1, that is hiding in these diagrams as well. Okay? Just for fun, how many m states are here? 2L plus 1. Right? Uh, L equals 0, so 1. And that M state is 0. How many M states are in these? 2L plus 1. 3. And how many M states are in hiding in there? 2L plus 1. Okay. All right. Are you ready to get it right now? You guys are so excited. I can tell you just love this stuff. Yeah, well, I doubt there's much other opportunity to see this stuff. I didn't understand spectroscopy fully until I understood the atom better. That's why I want to teach it. All right, Dirac. Well, guess what? Let's talk about the successes of Schrodinger again. We reproduce the energy structure of the Bohr atom, which reproduces the spectrum known for hydrogen. Bohr's model was tremendously successful because it predicted also, in addition to the Balmer series, which was measured, it predicted the ultraviolet series of Lyman, and the infrared series of passion and blah, 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 down the spectrum. Schrodinger got the same answer. Energy levels, same answer. But he got more physics out of it. He got these um, angular momentum changes in these selection rules. Here's another thing that Bohr could not explain. The relative intensity of the lines. Why is H alpha more intense than H beta? Why is H alpha more intense than H beta. Did I say that one? I meant, I meant to say H beta, not N. Okay. Why, as you go further along the series, does the, the uh, intensities of the transition lines get weaker? Or do you see anything in that mathematics that would tell you anything about that? Can you even figure out a way to try to extract from the mathematics of the Bohr atom any information like that? It can't even speak to it. There's nothing in that math that can speak to that. Good old Schrodinger's, on the other hand, turned out, and I didn't go through it yet because we haven't talked about transition probabilities, got it. He was able to take some mathematics and get the relative line intensities. That is a huge, pardon me, that is a huge step forward in your uh, theoretical model. Would you not agree? Okay, well, what did Bohr and Dirac get wrong? Turns out that the, where they thought the lines were on the spectrum, when people went and measured them, they were just a little bit off. They weren't exactly on the money, which meant their energy levels, and the differences in their energy levels, because their energy levels were not exactly right. So there's something about their models in which the energy states where the electron could be, we're not exactly right. This led people to think there's got to be more physics going on in the atom than what Schrodinger said. Well, turned out, and we're going to talk about spin and relativistic energies. If you looked at the Hamiltonian that Schrodinger used, it is a classical low velocity mechanics kinetic energy. It does not include for high velocities and relativistic kinetic energies. Okay? So Hamilton only accounted for non relativistic energies, okay? And the lines that were predicted were not exactly lined up. And there's a third one, too. Okay? Recently, in this time frame, electron spin had been discovered. And that was not included in the Schrodinger model. So there are three things about why we had to move forward. 22, 1922, Gerlach and Stern, it's called the Stern-Gerlach experiment. 
put a magnetic field, shot silver atoms through there, expected that they would deflect only in one direction when you make them go through a magnetic field, and instead they went two directions. That meant that they had magnetic moments, some up and some down, relative to the energy structure of the atom. So they figured that spinning things make magnetic fields and magnetic moments, so they called this spin. They were able to attribute to the electron, okay? And they said that basically you have spin of a half or spin of minus a half, and therefore the multiplicity of state was a half times two. That's, that's where the S of a half comes from. The multiplicity of states is two, up or down. We call it up or down. Two states. The Stern-Gerlach experiment, two possible states. To get that, for this uh, formalism, S has to be a half. One plus one is two. Or, if it's minus, the S is actually the, the absolute value of M sub S, M sub S being a half or minus a half. We come up with a wave function for the electron, okay? And then just as the angular momentum magnitude was little l times l plus 1 h bar, we find that the spin of the electron is little s times s plus 1 h bar, which means that it's always the same magnitude, which is the square root of 3 fourths h bar, because s is always a half. The z projection of the spin could be plus or minus a half of h bar. Okay. So drawing the diagram again, the magnitude of the spin vector is always three quarters h bar, and the projection on the z axis is always plus a half or minus a half, and again it pre processes around that. Okay. Now Dirac had to develop an entire new mathematics for this. And instead of wave functions, you got something called spinners. Okay? I'm not going to get into spinners. All right? And you had matrices instead of just single linear equations. Okay? But there is something called the Russell Saunders spin orbit coupling that came out of this. And I'm just going to just, again, without giving you the background, slap it on the table for you, okay? That is that you have a new, ang a new total angular momentum vector called J. It's the orbital angular momentum L plus the spin angular momentum. And remember, I told you the magnitude of that is the square root of little l times l plus 1, and the magnitude of that is the square root of little s times s plus 1 times h bar, okay? Vector addition, okay? J also by following the standards is little j times j plus one. So every electron has a little j and a little l and a little m and a little m sub j and a little m sub l and a little m sub m. Okay. Like all of a sudden the quantum numbers are drawing here. The little j of the single electron is if L equals zero is just the spin, obviously. And if the um, L is not zero, but is one or greater, it's L plus or minus S. S is always a half. So if L equals one, this is a half or three halves. L equals two, this is three halves or five halves. Okay. This is for the entire atom but with the single electron atom, the single electron and the atom have the same state. Now, you have m sub j, which is m sub l plus m sub s, and that goes from minus j to j in, in intervals of j plus 1, j plus minus j plus 2, all the way to j minus 1j. So it, it goes up in steps of 1, starting at minus j, but remember that j can have half interval values, minus 3 halves, minus 1 half, a half, 3 halves, for example. Okay. So j goes from a half, because that's the lowest value when l equals 0, up to n minus a half. Okay. 
So basically, you get this down at the bottom. And I know this is like all of a sudden, wow, what is all this? And I'm going to talk about the structure of it in a minute, and then it should all come together for you. So let's consider n equals 3. So no longer is this n now. This is L. This is J. And this is M sub J. Okay? n equals 3, you can have L equals 0, L equals 1, or L equals 2. Here's L equals 0, L equals 1, L equals 2. When L equals 0, you can have 1 J state. Because what is J equal? L equals 0, J has to equal a half. When J equals a half, M sub J can be minus a half or plus a half. When L equals 1, 1 plus or minus a half. It can equal a half, or it can equal three halves. And therefore, when, when J equals a half, it can equal minus a half or a half. And when J equals three halves, it can be minus three halves, minus a half, plus a half, and plus three halves. You get the point. J equals 2. Now notice this is interesting. There's, for each L, there's only two possible J states. Okay, when J equals 2, it's 3 halves or 5 halves. Okay, this is 4 halves. 3 halves, 5 halves. When it's 3 halves, 3 halves minus half plus half plus. When it's 5 halves, guess what? Minus 5 halves minus 3 halves minus half plus half plus 3 halves plus 5 halves. These are the states that are allowed without having gone through derivations. Okay. So what I want you to realize is there are two J states for every L. This is N equals 3, where you can have L 0, 1, 2. Okay. All right. Again, what we find out now is the multiplicity of states for level N is 2N squared. What's in three? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen possible states. That's two times n squared. Two times three squared. And that has to do with the spin. Because now your g of n l is this quantity. Before, remember, it was g, g of n l with Schrodinger was just two l plus one possible states. Now you have s is a half, so this is a 2, always. So you have 2 times 2 plus 1 for g and l. So you basically get this for the multiplicity of states. So now you're at level n. Now you're back to the one that you've been told all the time. You probably were told that that's the way it is for the Schrodinger album, Adam, if you add spin. And that was the case. So let's get to the chase now. The way to interpret this is you have the L vector of the angular momentum, you have the S vector, which is processing around the z-axis. The Together, when you take these processions of L and S, you get the total angular momentum vector, and that total angular momentum vector is now the constant of motion, which is processing around the z-axis. So while the L vector is going rare, 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 rare around the J vector, the L vector is now doing constant motion. And the energy now is related to the J state. Okay. So here's now the Dirac atom, N, L, J, N sub L, N sub J, M sub S. Here are the, the values that they can have. Here is the number of states, or their g sub n, okay? And then here's some discussion about those, but here's what I want to show you, is the energy structure. This is really important stuff. Does anybody remember, uh, you probably maybe do, maybe you don't, there was this uh, series of papers that came out around the year 2000 saying that the fine structure constant was evolving cosmically. 
Anybody remember that? Okay, well, it was big news. It went away, but it was fantastic because it would mean that the structure of atomic physics changed cosmically over time. We write the physics books. Okay. What equations did they use? To test that, I am now going to show you. Forget all this. Here is your classical Hamiltonian from Schrodinger. Okay. The when you add relativity and spin, it turns out that you're you're only changing the energy levels in the order of about 10 to the minus 5 of what they were. So basically you can use approximation theory called perturbation theory. And you could say to low order, I can write out three correction terms to the Hamiltonian. And I like to I like you to know what they are. The first one is a relativistic correction for relativistic momentum and energy, kinetic energy. This is a kinetic energy, classical. This corrects it for relativistic. This is the potential. This corrects the potential for the spin orbit interaction energy. Okay, And this last one is a very strange one that's called zwitter bewegen which happens to do for L equal zero electrons, you can get a little jitter from a quantum mechanical effect. All right. Okay. Now, what did I say you do to get the energies? Okay, we're going to call this delta E1, delta E2, and delta E3. Okay, just. Here's the Schrodinger energy plus a delta E plus another delta E plus a Let's treat each one of these separately. Okay, so what is delta E1 for spin orbit? Uh, sorry, the relativistic energy correction, delta E1. The spin orbit coupling correction, delta E2. And then the Darwin effect that's called for this Witter Bewegen for delta E equals 3. How do we get delta E equals 1? Well, we take the Hamiltonian because that returns the energy. And we sandwich it between the wave functions, like you did before, like Schrodinger did to get the energies, to get what that, what that energy turns out to be. So that's what we're going to do for each of them. We're going to take the integral over all space of the wave function and, and um, its complex conjugate. The star's not coming up there. Tell me I have a star there. Oh, God, I don't have a star there. i got to correct my book. OK. And then you sandwich in the energy correction, and that gives you the energy correction. Comes out the star. I need a star. This is supposed to be uh, a star right there for the complex conjugate. My bad. When you do that, and then you normalize it to the, the Schrodinger energy, you get this correction right here. All right. And this is basically uh, very close to the final answer. So basically, this is saying that the energy correction due to, hello, Aggies. The energy, the fractional energy correction, if you will, to due to the relativistic effects is goes as alpha squared over n squared times some little correction factor that depends upon L. Okay, so it depends on what L state you're in. The correction due to uh, spin orbit coupling, fractional correction, is also proportional to alpha squared over 2n, and then depends upon this j factor on the denominator. And then for the Darwin effect, the fractional correction, oh, sorry, for L equals not equals 0, it's this correction for L uh, with L equals minus a half, and for L equal not equal zero for J, uh, L plus half it equals that. So it depends upon whether you're going to use the up or the down version of S. Okay? So I wanted to write it in terms of J's. Then um, if for the uh, Darwin effect, which is the L equals zero effect, it's just alpha squared over N is the fractional correction. 
the fractional correction. These are on the order of 10 to the minus 5. If you sum all of these together appropriately, you get now that E, the energy, is now depends upon N and J. That is where the fine structure comes from. Because of the spin couple orbit coupling, now your energy state depends upon your J state as well. Is equal to E sub N plus the fractional energy, 1 plus the fractional energy. So the way to write that, E sub N, if you remember, 